We are almost at the end of our seminar on biblical interpretation, and I would like to thank you for joining us throughout these lessons. And with me is Dr. Frank Hazel from the Biblical Research Institute. Dr. Hazel, what is the topic of today's lesson? Today we are learning something about a fascinating subject, I think. Uh, it is uh, the relationship between the Bible and the prophetic gift. How does that belong together? How can we understand the influence of one of, of those factors on each other? As Adventists, we have proclaimed to go by sola scriptura, by scripture alone. And how does that fit with the prophetic gift that is also promised in the Bible and that biblical writers mentioned? What, what about the spirit of prophecy? What about Ellen White? and uh, biblical hermeneutics. What is her role in our understanding of the Bible? And what should her role be? And uh, this is something that we need to discuss and uh, that many people have questions. And uh, that is very important because we appreciate the prophetic gift in our church. And at the same time, we claim to go by the Bible alone. So how can we understand that connection? Isn't that a contradiction in itself? And I think uh, this uh, video and then the chapter in particular will teach you and tell you something that is really um, helpful in seeing the connections from the biblical text itself and from the understanding, the self-understanding of Ellen White, uh, who confirms basically that. And who will present the subject? The person who, who does that very skillfully and knowledgeably is uh, Dr. John Peckham. He is a North American scholar. He teaches at Andrews University. He is a professor of theology and Christian philosophy at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary there. And uh, he has dealt with that issue in, uh, in greater detail. In, he is a very accomplished um, writer and author and has published many, many books. And I think you will be greatly blessed by what he has to share on that particular subject. It is very balanced and uh, biblically founded and does justice and quotes uh, at length from uh, Ellen White's uh, literature to, to show how her understanding was on that particular subject. And, and I think you will be uh, blessed by, by understanding that relationship more integral and uh, more from a biblical perspective. So may God bless you as you listen to the video and then have time to read what he has written in the book. Joining us now to discuss the prophetic gift and the principle of sola scriptura is Dr. John Peckham. Thank you, Dr. Peckham. And as we lay the ground for our conversation, please explain to us what is sola scriptura and what does it affirm and what does it deny? Yeah, so the sola scriptura principle, the simplest way of understanding it is that it means that scripture is uniquely normative or it has unique authority or a ruling kind of authority by which uh, other claims, other sources, other theological ingredients should be judged. So the simplest way to understand sola scriptura is that scripture is the uniquely normative rule of faith and practice. Now, not everyone understands sola scriptura the same way. Sometimes when people hear sola scriptura, they think that means scripture alone by itself. You don't read anything else. You're not affected by anything else in any way whatsoever. And defined that way, uh, sola scriptura becomes isolationist, meaning that you are trying to read scripture by yourself. But in fact, no one ever reads scripture entirely by oneself. We, we all have been affected by other ingredients, other backgrounds, other traditions. On the, on the other hand, there are others who, when they say sola scriptura, they mean to say that scripture is a prime source, but some will use that phrase and then include other ingredients kind of on the same level as scripture. And so when people say sola scriptura, Christians say that they might mean different things. But when I use the phrase, and I think this is a biblical understanding of sola scriptura, even though the phrase isn't in scripture, the teaching is in scripture, that the Bible, the scripture itself is a uniquely normative rule of faith and practice. 
Now that can be unpacked into kind of three claims, but that's the basic idea. And these are the three claims in a nutshell. Number one, scripture is the unequaled, uniquely normative source of divine revelation, which is divinely commissioned to function as the rule of faith and practice. Number two, Scripture is the fully trustworthy and uniquely sufficient rule of faith and practice. And number three, Scripture is the final norm of faith and practice that norms all others. So in those three ways, Scripture stands alone. It's unique in those three ways. And sola scriptura means that by Scripture, everything else is to be judged when it comes to faith and practice. Now, there's three kinds of corollaries or things that go along with sola scriptura, the, uh, three other principles. The first is tota scriptura, which means that all of scripture is to function as this rule, not just parts, not just individual selections, but the entirety of the Bible, which we refer to as the biblical canon, we'll talk about a little bit later. So tota scriptura. The next principle goes right along with that. It's called the analogy of scripture. And the analogy of scripture simply means that you understand scripture by comparing parts of scripture with other parts of scripture. Or put differently, you understand parts of scripture by reading them in light of the rest of scripture, right? So the tota scriptura and the analogy of scripture, they go together, kind of like a hand in a glove. And then finally, last but certainly not least, is the principle that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So this is the principle of sola scriptura and corollaries that follow from it. Nevertheless, as I mentioned before, there's quite a bit of confusion about Sola Scriptura. So it's very important for us also to recognize four things that Sola Scriptura does not mean, to avoid misunderstandings, which is what causes problems when we start talking about uh, prophets outside of Scripture that we'll talk about a little bit later in this program. So the first thing that Sola Scriptura does not teach it does not teach that scripture is the only source of knowledge. The Bible itself tells us that there is knowledge outside of scripture and even outside of prophetic revelation. In fact, there's even other kinds of revelation. God has revealed himself in nature in a lesser way, in a way that isn't as clear, isn't always as discernible, and thus doesn't hold anything like the same kind of authority of scripture. But there's revelation even outside of scripture, which theologians sometimes call general revelation. And the Bible itself recognizes this. So if you think sola scriptura means that scripture is the only source of knowledge, well, then you're already contradicting the very scripture that, that you're reading, right? Or, or if you think it's even the only revelation, there can't be any other revelation outside of scripture, that already comes into conflict with scripture. Secondly, the sola scriptura principle does not affirm that all theological doctrines or church practices require direct biblical statements. In other words, you don't just quote scripture. It's what scripture is teaching, whether or not the words themselves are in scripture, so to speak. And that includes sola scriptura itself. Uh, sola scriptura is a Latin phrase, which means by scripture alone. That phrase is not found in scripture, but the teaching is found in scripture. Because the Bible teaches that this divine revelation commissioned by God stands alone as a rule or an authority. The third thing that sola scriptura does not mean is it does not mean or affirm that scripture excludes reason or requires no interpretation, or that one's private interpretation of scripture is the correct understanding of scripture. And finally, the fourth thing that sola scriptura does not mean, it does not mean that interpretive communities and tradition should be dismissed and or ignored. We can learn things from others' reading of scriptures. We can learn things from secondary sources like commentaries. It's just that those things cannot be normative, right? Those things must all be ruled by scripture itself. But we can still learn things from them. We don't just dismiss them or ignore them and read scripture in isolation. So sola scriptura denies both isolationism, where I read the Bible entirely by myself, but it also rules out any kind of creedalism, where there's something outside of scripture that is used as an authority or even a lens through which we read scripture. Ideally, scripture is allowed to rule uh, in the way that God commissioned it to rule. That's the sola scriptura principle in a nutshell. 
The Seventh-day Adventist theology comes under a lot of scrutiny and criticism regarding the principle of sola scriptura because we recognize the manifestation of the prophetic gift in Ellen White. Then how can we conciliate the fact that we affirm our belief on sola scriptura, as other Reformed faiths do, and accepting Ellen White's prophetic gift? Yes. Well, this is why it, it's so important to understand what sola scriptura teaches and does not teach. And so sola scriptura does not mean that scripture alone is the only source of revelation or even the only source of authority. It means that scripture is uniquely normative. Even scripture itself includes the teaching that there are other prophets that did not have any writings included in scripture. So in the Old Testament, you have prophets like Elijah, right? He didn't write any books of the Bible. You have the prophet Hulda. Uh, she didn't write any books of the Bible. In the New Testament, you have John the Baptist. Jesus said there was no prophet greater than him, but he didn't write anything in the Bible, right? Uh, of course, we're not there in the first century, but if we were, would we say, well, John the Baptist's teachings were not authoritative, or they were not meaningful, or they weren't prophetic? No, we'd have to say, yes, they were, and yet they're not part of the Bible. And so in order to be faithful to Scripture itself, we have to recognize prophets beyond those that wrote Scripture, and the technical terminology for that is extra-canonical prophets, right? Right or prophets outside of the canon of scripture. Now, not only do we have that in the Bible, we also have reasons to believe that there would be prophets even after the close of the biblical canon. Already in the first century, Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about prophets in the community, or at least those that claimed to have the gift of prophecy. And he said in 1 Corinthians 14 that the gift of prophecy, the prophets have to be subject to the prophets. That is, they have to be tested by existing prophecy. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, that anyone who is claiming to give a prophecy, if they don't actually accept and affirm Paul's authority as an apostle, then they're not really to be listened to. They're not really uh, uh, an authority, right? This is a paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 14, 37. But it's clear from the teaching in that chapter that there's not only the prophetic gift beyond those writing scripture, but that those who were to exercise the prophetic gift were themselves in subjection to the authoritative teachings of the apostles. And the apostles were the first generation witnesses of the, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so you have prophets beyond those that write scripture, but they are not as authoritative functionally as those prophets and apostles that were commissioned by God to write scripture. And then we have other teachings that reveal that there will be prophets in the last days, like Joel chapter 2 and others. And so you only have a problem with sola scriptura if you're accepting any kind of revelation or source outside of scripture as a normative source, either equal with scripture or above scripture. But Seventh-day Adventists believe that Ellen White's writings are prophetic, they're inspired by God, but they themselves are in subjection to the rule of Scripture. And it's actually by Scripture that we test whether Ellen White was a prophet and had the prophetic gift, and whether anyone else who would claim to have the prophetic gift is really a true prophet. And the canon of Scripture is closed. You cannot add to it, and we can talk more a little bit later about why it's closed and how that works. But the writings of Ellen White or any other one who claims to be a prophet themselves are tested by scripture and subjected to scripture. And this is not only in line with what scripture itself teaches about the authority of these prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles, uh, and the New Testament is the testimony of those apostles, that all the other prophets that come afterwards are subject to their authority. But this is also affirmed in Ellen White's own writings, where she clearly lays out that her writings are, in her words, one phrase she uses is a lesser light to the greater light. And so she makes it very clear that her writings are not to be considered on the same level as the canon of scripture and not to be used in the same way. How can we understand the concept of scripture as a canon? Yes. So let me talk about that a bit. So it's very important to understand that scripture is uniquely authoritative because it has been granted ruling authority by God. So the simplest way to understand this is God is the ruler, right? There's no one else who rules, no one else who has the authority that God has. God himself commissions particular messages that were written down by chosen or elect prophets in the Old Testament and chosen or elect apostles 
or close associates of those apostles that are under the guidance of those apostles with regard to the New Testament. And so you have these writings of these prophets and the apostles function as a rule or a standard. That's what the word canon means in its basic essence. A canon is a rule, okay? And so the biblical canon refers to the collection or body of writings that Christians believe God has commissioned to be the rule of faith and practice. And if we rightly recognize the books of scripture to be those writings that God has commissioned to be this rule, a uniquely normative rule of faith and practice, then the biblical books must hold an authority that other writings and other messages don't hold. So the simplest way to explain it is the ruler prescribed or commissioned writings to function as the rule. Now, these writings of the canon, of the biblical canon, possess this intrinsic ruling authority by virtue of being writings that God has appointed to be the rule. And the entire canon of scripture is best understood as a covenant witness document. What does that mean? It means that the writings of scripture are actually the testimony or the recorded witness to God's great acts of what is sometimes called the Old Covenant. That's what the Old Testament testifies to. And that is the revelation that leads up to the coming of Christ and to the New Testament, which is the testimony about the events of Christ, the coming of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the death and the resurrection of Christ, and the establishment of the church, and so on. And so the Old Testament and the New Testament are the witnesses to God's great covenantal acts in the history of redemption. So it's a witness document to God's great covenantal acts. That means the writings in it are the writings of covenantal prophets and apostles or close associates of apostles. What does that mean? Covenantal prophets and apostles are those who are recipients of revelation and inspiration that was commissioned by God to witness to and communicate God's covenantal revelation that pointed to Christ, that's the Old Testament, and God's covenantal revelation that testified to the Christ event, that is the New Testament. And so the writings of these covenantal prophets and apostles are intrinsically canonical, that is, they possess ruling authority because they have been commissioned by God, the ruler himself. So put kind of in the simplest terms, the biblical canon consists of the covenant witness leading up to the Christ event and the covenant witness to the Christ event. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled the Old Testament. And the way that he referred to the Old Testament and fulfilled it in his ministry actually ratified the Old Testament as actually coming from God. And he also commissioned the New Testament as a witness to himself. He commissioned the apostles and the apostles provided this unrepeatable, firsthand, first-generation witness to Christ and his resurrection. Now, once Christ comes, that's his first coming, and we're now awaiting his second coming. When he comes, he establishes this testimony, these apostles, to record this unrepeatable witness to this great event of redemption history. Once Christ has come and done this, this and once the apostles he appointed die and leave behind their writings, the canon is effectively closed. If the canon is just understood as a witness to this covenantal revelation. So once these first generation appointed apostles die away, there cannot be any other revelation that can equal those apostles that were appointed by the ruler. Why? Very simply, once the ruler comes, the rule that he appoints is unequaled until the ruler himself returns. In other words, those apostles that he appointed and testified to his resurrection as a cloud of witnesses stand as a kind of historical testimony and historical witness appointed by God that could not be equaled by anything else in history until the ruler himself comes back. So anything that is going to come and claim to be prophetic or from God has to help measure up to that standard of that apostolic witness, that first generation testimony, and the Old Testament that Christ also ratified in his ministry. So that's what we mean when we say scripture is a covenant witness document. 
and that scripture is a canon or a collection of books that is divinely commissioned by God. And it has a unique authority because it consists of those books that God commissioned to function in that uniquely authoritative way. Is the canon closed? What is the relationship between the canon of scripture and non-canonical prophets? Very simply, the relationship between the canon of scripture and non-canonical prophets is that canonical scripture has a unique kind of authority. It has ruling authority because the ruler himself, that is God, gave that authority to scripture. Any prophet who has authority only has authority in virtue of being commissioned by God and giving a prophetic gift and a prophetic message. So a, the authority of a prophetic message or a prophetic messenger is relative to whatever authority God grants them. God sets up throughout history particular authorities by which later revelations were to be tested. And so they're already functioning as rules or standard even before we have uh, even the terminology of a canon. So in Old Testament times, you have Moses who writes the first five books of the Old Testament, right? Which we sometimes call the Pentateuch or what's often called the Torah. And Moses is appointed as a, a uniquely authoritative prophet in the community of Israel. And any prophet that comes after Moses has to be tested by the writings that Moses gave. And if they do not agree, the way Isaiah 820 puts it to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, there is no light in them, right? And so later prophets must agree with earlier prophets, starting with Moses. So already you see this kind of covenantal, uniquely ruling authority. And it's very interesting that even at the time of Moses, Moses wasn't the only prophet in the community of Israel. Both Aaron, Moses' brother, and Miriam, Moses' sister, are said to have had the gift of prophecy, at least at times. And yet they did not hold the same kind of authority as Moses or his teachings. You can see that in the episode of Numbers 12 and other places. So not all prophets have the same functional authority. Moses had a particular kind of ruling authority. And after Moses, any message had to be tested by Moses. And then you have other prophets that are, are ratified by God. Moses himself was ratified by God to the community, right? In Numbers 12 and other places where it says, this is the one who speaks for me. And he has this, this particular unique kind of authority. And later prophets also are attested to by God. And they were to be tested by the earlier prophetic authority. Then when it comes to the New Testament, the apostles themselves encouraged people to test them by the existing scriptures in the Old Testament. So in the book of Acts, the Bereans are actually affirmed and praised because they tested everything the apostles taught by what? By the scriptures, by which they mean, it means the old, what we call the Old Testament now, right? And so the apostolic teaching is tested by the Old Testament, and Christ himself fulfills the Old Testament, but also commissions the New Testament to function as this unique rule. Now, as we mentioned earlier, once the ruler comes and goes, the rule that he established remains the unique rule that is unequaled until the ruler returns. So until Christ comes back, that apostolic witness and the Old Testament witness that Christ ratified and commissioned, which we call the canon of scripture, functions as a rule that is unequaled by any other prophet that comes afterward. And so any prophet that comes both at the time of the apostles, as we see in 1 Corinthians 14, and any prophet that might arise later in history has to be tested and subjected to that unique historical rule that God gave to function as the rule of faith and practice. So non-canonical prophets, if they're true prophets, their messages are authoritative, their messages are inspired, but their authority can never equal the authority of scripture because they have to be tested by that unique rule that was given by Christ, the ruler himself. How did Ellen White relate her own prophetic gift to scripture? In relation to this question of, of how Ellen White relates her own prophetic gift to scripture, it's very significant that she herself emphasizes over and over again that any prophetic gift or prophetic teaching outside of scripture must always be subject to scripture, including her own teachings, right? So she affirmed, among other things, that scripture is to be our only rule of faith and practice. So in one place, she wrote this. She said, quote, 
there is need of a return to the great Protestant principle, the Bible and the Bible only as the rule of faith and duty. And that's in the book, The Great Controversy, page 204. And over and over again, I could list quote after quote after quote where she affirms this standard. Now, of course, if scripture is to be our only rule of faith and duty, that means that any message, even a prophetic message outside of scripture, including your own writings, can't be the rule of faith and duty. It has to be subject to that, right? And this was her consistent teaching. She taught, in, in relation to that, she consistently taught that scripture is sufficient and should be understood by comparing scripture with scripture, taking scripture as a whole. So for example, she wrote in one place, quote, the Bible contains all the principles that men need to understand in order to be fitted either for this life or for the life to come. That's from the book Education, page 123. So that's the sufficiency of scripture. And then she also affirms that scripture is not just sufficient with regard to being a source of faith and practice, but also in relation to interpretation, that scripture is to be interpreted in comparison with other scripture, which means that something outside of scripture can't be, should not be used as a normative interpreter of scripture. So she writes, for example, quote, she writes, the Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with scripture. The student should learn to view the word as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme of God's original purpose for the world of the rise of the great controversy and the work of redemption. So there she's affirming without using the terminology, not only sola scriptura, but what we talked about earlier, tota scriptura, all of scripture, and the analogy of scripture, comparing scripture with scripture. And she also very clearly affirms the principle that uh, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Over and over again, she clearly distinguishes the canon of scripture from non-canonical prophetic messages, including her own writings. So for example, in one place, she says this. She says, during the ages while the scriptures of both the Old and New Testament were being given, the Holy Spirit did not cease to communicate light to individual minds, apart from the revelations to be embodied in the sacred canon. The Bible itself relates how, through the Holy Spirit, men received warning, reproof, counsel, and instruction in matters in no way relating to the giving of the scriptures. And mention is made of prophets in different ages, of whose utterances nothing is recorded. In like manner, after the close of the canon of the scripture, the Holy Spirit was still to continue to work to enlighten, warn, and comfort the children of God. That's the end of the quote. So there she clearly affirms God's activity in giving prophetic messages, both at the time scripture was being written and even after the canon is closed. So she recognizes that the canon is closed, but there'll be later prophetic messages. But then she also very clearly distinguishes those later prophetic messages from scripture, including her own writings. And so she says things like this, quote, our position and faith is in the Bible and never do we want any soul to bring in the testimonies by which she meant her own writings. She said, never do we want any soul to bring in the testimonies ahead of the Bible. That's in the book Evangelism, page 256. Elsewhere, she insists that her writings are not, quote, an addition to the word of God as some make it appear. That's in Testimonies to the Church, volume four, page 246. She emphasized in this regard that, quote, the spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed to supersede the Bible. For the scriptures explicitly state that the word of God is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. That is from the book, The Great Controversy. Again, she explains, quote, God has in that word promised to give visions in the last days. But this is not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from Bible truth. And that is from her book, Early Writings, page 78. So she refers to her own writings as a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light by which she meant the Bible. And she wrote things like, the Lord desires you to study your Bibles. He has not given any additional light to take the place of his word. And I could go on and on with many, many other quotations like this, but her entire ministry is bathed in scripture and she consistently upholds scripture as the uniquely normative rule. And she continually teaches that doctrines should not be based on her writings or other extra canonical prophetic messages, but all doctrines should be based on the Bible and the Bible alone. 
So she just said explicitly, in fact, uh, during a controversy uh, in the church around uh, 1888, she was being asked to settle this particular controversy by leaders in the church. They, they plead, pleaded with her. They said, please give us a prophetic message that tells us wit, who is right in this doctrinal controversy. And she refused to do so. And she said this, quote, we want Bible evidence for every point we advance. So even though we had a living prophet in the church at the time, and I believe there's good evidence that she was a true prophet, she herself in her own ministry upheld the principle that our doctrine should not be based on this living prophetic gift, but only on scripture, because scripture is a unique rule. And she, again, herself consistently affirmed this principle. So anyone who believes in the Bible should already be holding that principle, that any prophet that comes after those, those apostles appointed by Christ have to be tested by their testimony. Nothing can equal the event of Christ and his resurrection, right? Nothing can match that with regard to something that gives us confidence of authoritative teachings that came from Christ himself, who lived as a human being and died and rose from the dead. Nothing can match that, right? So we should already know that from the Bible. But then those of us who have confidence that Ellen White was a true prophet, we also know that from her writings. Anybody who believes she's a true prophet should use her writings in a way that's consistent with the way that she herself taught they should be used, not putting them on the same plane of scripture, but recognizing that they are to be subjected to scripture, not because they are lesser inspired or of, of lesser usefulness in some way, but because God in his infinite wisdom appointed scripture to be a uniquely normative rule that can help us discern between truth and error so that a prophet couldn't arise centuries later and mislead people to go this way or that and say, I came from God. And we have to sit back and say, hmm, that person seems like a prophet, that person doesn't. Or maybe prematurely put someone on the same level that later turns out to be a false prophet. No, this cannot happen because even a true prophet that comes is not to be put on the same plane as that witness to Christ given by the apostles and the earlier prophets. So any prophet is continually tested and any prophet that would arise that would say, my teachings are on the same level of the Bible that's already giving you evidence that they're not really a true prophet. They're not really coming from Christ. So this is made quite clear in Ellen White's writings that her own prophetic messages are subject to scripture and not of the same functional authority. Given what we have covered in this discussion, does recognition of prophetic writings outside of Scripture undermine the Sola Scriptura principle? Is the Sola Scriptura principle consistent with affirming the prophetic gift of Ellen White? This all comes down to a proper understanding of Sola Scriptura. If one thinks that Sola Scriptura means that there can be no prophetic teaching that's not in Scripture itself or not by someone who wrote Scripture, then there would be a problem. But the way Sola Scriptura principle is taught in scripture itself, that we talked about earlier, that scripture is uniquely authoritative, but there can also be other prophets, there can also be other revelation. There is no conflict. Recognizing prophets outside of scripture is perfectly consistent with the Sola Scriptura principle. As long as any prophetic message or prophet outside of scripture that is affirmed is tested by scripture, and held to be in subjection to the authority of Scripture. So given that understanding of Sola Scriptura, it's perfectly consistent to recognize Ellen White's prophetic gift and hold that her non-canonical prophetic authority is a lesser authority that is not on par with the uniquely normative ruling authority of the canon of Scripture. And this is not only consistent with Scripture's own teachings, it follows from Ellen White's writings themselves that there is this differentiation, as we saw, between canonical writings and uh, extra-canonical prophetic writings. So, put simply, if scripture is the only rule of faith in practice, no other writings can function as the only rule of faith in practice. So if someone accepts Ellen White's writings or any other prophetic writing or other source as of finally normative authority, then that would be inconsistent with the Sola Scriptura principle. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church is consistent in affirming that Ellen White's authority as a prophet of God, which we believe she was a true prophet of God, is subject to the uniquely normative ruling standard of scripture. And scripture is uniquely normative in that way because the ruler commissioned it to function 
as that standard by which everything else is to be tested. Thank you so much, Dr. Peckhan, and thank you too for being with us. See you next time. For a deeper understanding of this topic, go to AdventistBiblicalResearch.org slash store and buy the book Biblical Hermeneutics and Adventist Approach. For additional resources, visit AdventistBiblicalResearch.org.